lecture is a quick first look at DC circuits. Well, what is a circuit? A circuit is a, a connected network of electrical devices connected by wires. And uh, electric charge can move through the wires. That's electric current. And DC means direct current. That means that the flow of charge through the wires, the electric current, is steady, is not changing rapidly over time. Now the key point about a, uh, about a circuit is that the exact spatial arrangement of the part of the parts of the circuit doesn't matter. Um, only how things are connected to other things matters. Only the way things are connected by wires, the topology of the circuit. Um, so these two arrangements of, of three devices connected by wires are in fact exactly the same. They represent the same circuit. And they'll behave the same when we connect them together and, and, and see what happens. Very different spatial arrangements can have the same topology. Now, when we make diagrams of circuits, we'll generally choose to make the diagrams in a nice, easy schematic way that really shows that topology. But in fact, if the circuit you make in your lab looks like this instead of like this, it's the same. Okay, let's talk about electric current, the flow of charge. Now, um, uh, charge, which we often denote by Q, has a unit which is the coulomb. You're familiar with that. And, and you are also probably familiar that one coulomb is a lot of free charge. A one coulomb charge is enormous. In fact, in fact, even much less charge is enormous. So suppose we had a point charge um, which has one microcoulomb of charge, a positive charge of one microcoulomb here. Then if we were fairly close to it, let's say we were one centimeter away, then the electric field there would be around 100 million volts per meter. 100 million volts per meter. That's a gigantic electric field. In fact, it's enough to start stripping electrons off of air molecules. And so what would happen is you'd have an electric discharge around this, uh, around this one microcoulomb charge. Um, the electrons would be attracted to the positive charge. The, the positive ions would be repelled from it. And, and it would quickly discharge. So one microcoulomb is a free charge that would be, that would be enormous. Now, electric current, which we denote by the letter I, is measured in units called amperes, letter A. And one ampere is a coulomb per second. It tells us how much charge passes a particular point in the wire. And an ampere current is not that big. It's very commonplace. It's about the current that you get out of your phone charger. So that's a bit of a paradox. One coulomb is gigantic. One ampere is not so big. The reason for this is that um, one gram of ordinary matter has no net electrical charge, but it contains huge positive and negative charges. Roughly speaking, a gram of ordinary matter contains around 50,000 coulombs of positive charge in the form of protons and negative 50,000 coulombs of negative charge in the form of the electrons in the atoms. It all adds up to, to zero, but, but the, the, um, that zero is composed of gigantic positive and negative charges in ordinary matter. So that means that if we want to make a current flow in a wire by, by making the electrons move in some direction, we don't have to make those electrons move very fast to have an enormous amount of charge passing a point in the wire. So the book has an estimate for the, the drift speed of electrons in a current carrying wire, and their estimate is that the drift speed is about 10 to the minus fourth meters per second. That's a tenth of a millimeter per second. The electrons in a wire are moving so slowly it would be very, if you could see electrons, it would be very difficult to see that overall movement. Now, I want to add that this is not the speed of the electrons in the wire. 
actually the electrons are moving very, very fast in all kinds of directions. This is sort of the overall average speed. It's like a swarm of bees. The individual bees are flying every which way really, really fast. But the overall swarm may not be moving at all, or it may be just slightly drifting to, uh, to the left or to the right. So, so uh, uh, the drift speed is kind of um, the average speed when you take into account the fact that the electrons are going all over the place at, uh, at, at uh, thousands or even hundreds of thousands of meters per second. Okay, so let's think about a wire. Now, the electrons in the wire are negatively charged, and that has a peculiar consequence. It says if the electron drift speed is, is to the left, then um, that means that the electric current goes to the right. Um, the, uh, the electric current goes in the direction that, uh, that um, uh, positive charge would be building up. And as the electrons go that way, uh, the, the, what's left here becomes more and more positive. So, um, uh, so the, the direction of the electric current is opposite to the direction of motion of the electrons in the wire. Now, for DC circuits, it, it's often easier just to pretend that the, that the uh, charge carriers that are moving around in the wire are positive, positive charge carriers. Um, and, uh, and, um, uh, that they, and so they would be moving in the same direction as the electric current. But, but um, uh, whenever, we, whenever we talk that way, we ought to keep in the back of our minds what's really going on is that as current flows to the right, that means that this um, complicated swarm of electrons inside the wire is actually creeping very slowly to the left in the other direction. Now, our circuits are going to be made out of devices that we might call two-terminal devices. These are devices that have two ends where you can attach other devices. So here's an example. Here's a device. It's got two ends. Terminal A and Terminal B. And for each such device, we're going to be interested in two quantities. The first one is the current, the current flowing through the device from A to B. And it's, it, we denote that by the letter I, of course. It's measured in amperes. Now that current, if we've decided to, 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 uh, to have the positive direction be from A to B, that current could be positive or negative. If it were negative, that means the current would be flowing the other way. We're also going to be interested in the potential difference between the two terminals. We'll denote that by V, or sometimes VAB, the potential at A minus the potential at B. Now, you'll recall what electric potential is. Electric potential is electric potential energy per unit charge. And so um, uh, uh, that means that potential is measured in volts. A volt is a joule per coulomb. And once again, it can be positive or negative. It'll be positive if the potential at A is higher than the potential at B, and negative if it goes the other way. And we'll often just call the potential difference between the terminals of the device just the voltage across the device. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with a list of some two terminal devices that we're interested in understanding. And each one has rules that govern the current through the device, and the voltage between the terminals of the device. The first of our two terminal devices is the simplest, a wire. A wire has two ends to which we can attach other wires, other devices. And in our diagrams, it's just a straight line, a solid line, or possibly a curved line. And, um, uh, and the point about a wire is that, uh, that electric current can flow freely through it. So the current through the wire can be anything. And for an ideal wire, the potential difference between the two ends is always zero. And that means that if we have two points in a circuit which are connected by just a plain wire, those two points must have the same potential. The voltage across the wire is always zero. A wire is analogous to a, to a pipe. There's a, a pipe of water. Water is free to flow through the pipe in either direction. And because the water is free to move, you can't really maintain a pressure difference between the two ends of the pipe. Our second device is almost as obvious. It's a switch. 
a, a switch has two states. So, so you notice here, here's a switch. It has uh, two terminals where I could plug in other things. And it could be open, in which case there's no conducting path from one side to the other. Or it can be closed, in which case there is a conducting path. Current can flow from one end to the other. If the switch is open, the current is therefore zero. And the potential difference could be anything. The two parts of the circuit on opposite sides of the switch are, are not even connected to each other in any way. But when you close the switch, it becomes a wire. And the current can be anything. And the potential difference between the two sides of the, of the switch is zero. Our next two-terminal device is a resistor. Here's an example of a resistor right here. And in our diagrams, resistors are a little jagged line um, connecting terminals A and B. And you can think of a resistor as basically a wire with friction. And so there's a, there's a, um, there's a, a rule about resistors called Ohm's Law. It was uh, discovered about 200 years ago by uh, Gustav Ohm. And, uh, and it says this, the potential difference between the terminals of the resistor is the current through the resistor times a quantity called R, the resistance of the resistor. And that's a, a property of the device. It's measured in ohms. Ohms are denoted by the capital Greek letter omega. And an ohm is, from this equation we can tell, an ohm is obviously a volt per ampere. Um, this is not a fundamental law of nature, but it's, uh, it's something that's true for a very wide variety of devices, so we call it Ohm's Law. And uh, so, okay, great. There's a lot to unpack here. Let's, let's, um, let's sort it out. First thing to talk about is signs. Okay? Um, current flows from higher voltage, higher potential to lower potential. So if the current's flowing from A to B, that means that, that the potential of A is higher than the potential at B. Um, and if we, uh, if we let I represent that current from A to B, of course, I could be negative. The current could be flowing the other way, in which case V would also be negative because the potential at B would be higher than the potential at A. Moral of that story is we're going to need to be careful about signs. We're going to be need, need to be careful about thinking which direction we're um, imagining is the positive direction for current through the resistor. The second thing is that, is that R, the resistance, is a property of the device. So uh, uh, what do I mean? Um, well, it depends on the material the device is made of, a property of the material called its resistivity. It depends on the shape that that material is, is put in. It, um, it may de depend on the temperature and all kinds of things. Um, uh, and, uh, and you can buy manufactured resistors with, a, with standard values of the resistance. And they're often indicated by colored stripes. But take a look at this one. Perhaps you can see my stripes are red, yellow, red, and gold. And that means 2,400 ohms plus or minus 5%. The gold stripe means it's a plus or minus 5% resistor. And lots of things are effectively um, uh, resistors. For example, an incandescent light bulb is basically a wire with friction. And the, 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 the current passing through the, um, uh, the, 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 the filament of the bulb causes the filament to heat up so hot that it, that it glows. And that's how it produces light. A resistor is sort of analogous to a, a pipe with, which is partly obstructed, maybe a pipe full of rocks, okay? Water can still flow from one end of the pipe to the other, but you, you have to push it to overcome that friction. And water will flow from higher pressure to lower pressure. And it, it seems reasonable to imagine that the rate at which water flows through the pipe might be proportional to that pressure difference. That would be the, the water pipe version of Ohm's law. And of course, Real wires are generally really resistors. They're really resistors, um, uh, except that they're, they're res the, the, the value of their resistance, their R value, is really tiny, a tiny fraction of an ohm. So since this number is close to zero, the potential between the two ends of the wire 
is essentially zero no matter what the current is. So now we have our fourth kind of device, the EMF. That's written EMF. Um, don't pronounce it EMF. It's actually an abbreviation. It stands for electromotive force, which is kind of an old-fashioned term. Um, uh, and the diagram for it is that there's a, there's a, um, a long line and a short line uh, between the two terminals. Now, an EMF is analogous to a pump. A pump can push water from a lower pressure to a higher pressure. And in the same way, EMF can, uh, can help current move from a lower potential to a higher potential. Um, the, uh, 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 and so it's a device that actually converts some other kind of energy to electrical energy in the circuit. For instance, a battery, which is a kind of EMF, um, a battery converts chemical energy to electrical energy. A photocell would convert light energy into electrical energy. Um, uh, a, a generator would convert mechanical energy from a turbine, say, to, uh, to electrical energy. A, a power supply that we plug into the wall would convert electrical energy from the utility company to electrical energy in our circuit. Um, so uh, uh, the, the key rule about, about um, an EMF is that the potential difference between the two terminals is fixed. It has a fixed value depending on the device, um, the EMF of the device, um, script E. And that's independent of the current. The current can be anything, but the potential difference between the two sides is, um, is fixed. Uh, in the diagram, the, um, the side with the longer line has the higher potential. And in a battery, for example, the, uh, the end with the... Uh, uh, with the little the little bump is the uh, is the one that that's the the positive end the higher potential end and for this particular val battery there's a there's a, an EMF of 1.5 volts a potential difference a constant potential difference between the two sides of the battery of 1.5 volts. Okay, so that's four items so far: EMF, resistor, wire, and switch. We can do a lot just with those. Um, we can study complicated and interesting circuits. But uh, um, let's, uh, let's mention one more, because, uh, because that's, that's worth mentioning, and that is a diode. Now, a diode has this funny-looking symbol here, and, uh, um, and the thing about a diode is that it's an asymmetrical device. Electric current flows more easily one direction through the diode than the other. Uh, and furthermore, the relationship between the, the, um, uh, the voltage across the diode and the current through the diode is not a simple linear relationship like Ohm's law, but uh, a more complicated curve. Uh, a good example of that would be a light-emitting diode, an LED. Here's one. And, uh, and an, an LED uh, is such that uh, at ordinary voltages, almost no current can flow one direction through the LED. But... Uh, in the other direction, if the, uh, if the potential difference is above a certain threshold value, then current flows through and the LED glows with a characteristic color. A diode is like a one-way pipe, a one-way valve, like a, a ball valve in a, um, in a pipe. But, or, or more particular, uh, maybe a better analogy would be a, uh, a water wheel with a ratchet. So if, it, if water flows this way, it can turn the wheel. If it tries to flow that way, the wheel just sort of blocks the flow. All right. There are lots of other electrical devices. There are two terminal devices like capacitors and inductors. Uh, there, are, uh, there are devices with three or more terminals like, uh, like um, transistors. Uh, but this will be enough to put together really interesting electrical circuits that will help us understand um, a lot of, of experimental apparatus and, uh, and um, sort of uh, su support us and prepare us for, for experiments that we'll be doing in the, in the lab on DC circuits. Electric circuits are governed by two basic rules called Kirchhoff's rules. Um, named after Gustav Kirchhoff, Kirchhoff who um, uh, formulated them in the 1840s. And there are two rules, and they're both very simple and very elegant. And the first one is Kirchhoff's junction rule, sometimes called the node law. 
So let's suppose you have a big complicated electrical circuit, and this is a, this is a junction point or a node point. A junction or node is a point in the circuit where two or more wires meet. Um, and, uh, and there may be current flowing along each of these wires. And so I'll imagine that there's a current flowing into the junction here, a current I. And I is here, and I is here. These I's could be different. Uh, and in fact, if the current was flowing out, then the I would be negative. So there's a, for each one of these wires meeting at this junction, there's a current I flowing in. The junction rule is very simple. It says if you add up all the currents flowing into the node, you get zero. Or another way of putting that is that the current flowing into the node has to exactly equal the current flowing out of the node. The positive and negative terms in this sum must cancel. Well, why is that true? Well, there's sort of two points involved, and the first point is a conservation law. Charge is conserved. And that means if there's a net flow of electric charge into this junction, that must mean that at the junction, charge is accumulating, is building up. And that brings us to point two, which is that a, a, a charge buildup cannot really continue for very long. Remember, um, uh, a, a, an ampere is a coulomb per second. So if we had a net unbalanced current flowing into this node of one milliampere, and that continued for a really short period of time, one millisecond, then one milliampere times one millisecond would mean that you'd build up a charge at this node of one microcoulomb. But we already saw that a microcoulomb is actually an amazingly big charge. It would produce huge electric fields, which would completely disrupt the currents, which would, uh, which would cause electrical discharges in the air. And so the moral of the story is that that wouldn't happen. Um, even over very short times, the currents will balance pretty much exactly. The net inflow into any junction will be zero. The second of Kirchhoff's rules is the loop rule, or the loop law. Um, and so we have a big electrical network, and what we do is we, we identify a closed loop. A closed loop is just a, 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 a closed path where I follow wires or conducting, conducting elements. I just, I just follow it around. Okay? And, um, and uh, that's, a, that's a loop. It's a closed path in the circuit network. And each segment of that closed path has a certain potential difference v across it. Um, and of course, these v's could be different. They could be positive if the potential increased. It could be negative if the potential decreased. Uh, but I'll just call all of them v. And the loop rule is very simple. It says for any closed loop in your circuit, the sum of the potential differences around the loop is zero. Okay, that kind of makes sense because, of course, these are changes in the potential. And, and sometimes you'll go up, sometimes you'll go down, but when you get back to the same point, you'd better wind up with the same potential. The net change should be zero. The potential increases along the path should be equal to the potential decreases. So physically, where does that come from? Well, the, um, once again, point one, it comes from a, 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 a conservation principle that electric forces are conservative. The work done by an electric force, the electric force on a charge, um, uh, can, uh, is related to a potential energy function. And that means that the network done on a charge moving around a closed loop in our circuit, that network is zero. And point two is that electric potential is just that potential energy of the charge per unit charge. And so that means that there's a potential function um, and when you add up all the changes in the potential function, you get zero. Okay, the junction rule and the loop rule are the fundamental rules about electric circuits. They're extremely applicable and powerful um, principles about electric circuits. And they let us analyze the behavior of even very complicated electrical networks. We're going to start by looking at these two rules in action in 
some very simple electric circuits. Let's consider a really simple circuit. It's just got three elements plus some wires. There's an EMF of three volts. There's a switch, which we can have open or closed, and then there's a resistor with a resistance of 120 ohms, and then it's connected back uh, to the other end of the EMF with a wire. Now, when the switch is open, charge cannot flow through the circuit, and so the currents are all zero. But now let's suppose I close the switch, and I ask the following question. After I close the switch, what is going to be the electric current through the resistor? Well, I'm going to imagine that that electric current, I'm going to make a guess that that electric current is flowing this way. So I want to know what the value of the electric current is flowing that direction. What do Kirchhoff's laws tell me about this? Well, what does the junction law tell me about it? I'm going to close the switch now. What does the junction law tell me? And the junction law tells me that the electric current is the same everywhere through the circuit. It's the same here, and here, and here, and here. Because at any node, any place where two wires join, I know that the current that flows in has to equal the current that flows out. OK, that's really all that the, uh, all that the junction law tells me. How about the loop law? Well, here, there's only one loop to consider. It's this big loop. So let's, let's add up the potential changes as I go around the loop, let's say, clockwise. OK, so first I'll go past the EMF. And so the net potential uh, change going around the EMF is just E. I go up by 3 volts going from below to, to above, because the long side is the higher potential side of the, uh, of the EMF. Going through the, uh, the switch, there's no, the switch is closed, so there's no potential difference between the two sides of the switch. Going through the resistor, well, let's see, current is flowing in this direction. So this, this um, uh, point on the, uh, on the circuit has to be at a higher potential than that point in the circuit, and the difference it has to be um, I times R. So I have to go down by I times R. And then this um, is just a wire, so, the, so there's no potential difference there. And so E minus I R has to equal zero. Which means, of course, which means, of course, that E is equal to I times R. Or another way of putting it, uh, another way of putting it is that is that the uh, is that the current is equal to E divided by R, which is three volts divided by one hundred twenty ohms. And so our final answer is that the current is let's see three divided by one hundred twenty is one fortieth or zero point zero two five amps, which is the same as 25 milliamps. And that is the current flowing through the resistor. And because we got a positive number, we know that our guess about the direction of the current was correct. This is the direction of the current. If there were positive charge carriers, they'd be moving down to the resistor. Of course, we probably know there are electrons, and so electrons are creeping upward. But um, the current flow is down. 25 milliamps. All of this brings up the question of how we measure electric current and, um, and uh, voltage. Well, we measure it with current and voltage meters. Uh, an ammeter measures electric current. What electric current? The electric current through the meter. And, what, uh, and a voltmeter measures the electric potential difference between the two sides of the meter. So, of course, these meters are themselves two terminal devices. In practice, we often use a single device that has different settings. Turn the knob this way, and it's an ammeter. Turn the knob that way, it functions as a voltmeter. And the, um, and the, uh, um, the device has two terminals that I can use to attach it to the outside world. Now, there's a distinction between ammeters and voltmeters, which is worth thinking about. 
The ammeter measures the current that flows through the meter. So if you want to use that current to measure, for example, the current flowing through a resistor, then you must, be, you must place the ammeter in the path of the current. You must put it in what's called series with the resistor so that, the, um, so that any electric charge that flows through the resistor must also flow through the ammeter. And, uh, and, and that's how you hook up the, uh, um, the, the meter to measure electric current. But for a voltmeter, you're measuring the potential difference across the meter. So to measure the, um, the potential difference across a resistor, say, we just take the two leads of the, of the voltmeter and we clip them to opposite sides of the resistor. The, the, um, uh, the, the, this is said to be in parallel with the resistor. Um, now, when we put a meter on a circuit, we actually change the circuit a little bit, but we don't want to change it much. So how do we, uh, how do we make sure? Well, here, the thing we don't want is we don't want um, uh, the potential difference between the two sides of the ammeter to be significant. We want it to be as if there was just a wire there. And to make that happen, we make sure that the internal resistance of the ammeter is very low, as close to zero as possible, a fraction of an ohm. On the other hand, um, when we uh, hook up the, uh, the voltmeter here, we don't want uh, electric current, uh, very significant amounts of electric current, to flow through the voltmeter. We want it all to go through the resistor so it still has the same potential difference that it had before. And to make that happen, we make sure that the voltmeter itself has an extremely large internal resistance, millions of ohms, so that, um, so that by clipping it onto the outside, that doesn't change the circuit very much. So these are two important two terminal devices that we haven't mentioned but we need to think about. Ammeters and voltmeters, they're introduced into the circuits in different ways and they measure different important quantities that we, um, we might want to find out in our laboratory. Okay, that's, um, that's it for our first taste of DC circuits. We've had a look at some of the fundamentals. We'll dig deeper into the subject both in uh, the, our class meeting and also in, uh, in the homework that you'll be doing over the coming days. Electric circuits are really fundamental. There's almost no piece of scientific apparatus that doesn't involve electric circuits. And so a knowledge of how they work and of the principles that, uh, that govern how they work will be, uh, will be a an indispensable tool in our understanding of the uh, theory and experimental basis of modern physics.